The land behind me is Chalon in northern France. Today, Chalon is in the heart of the Champagne region. But 1600 years ago, in 451 AD, it was the scene of one of the biggest and bloodiest battles in ancient history. I'm Matthew Settle. Nearly half a million men fought here as the Roman general Atias tried to halt the advance of Attila the Hun and his terrifying barbarian hordes. Now, with new video game technology, you're about to see this great battle as never before. The vast numbers of soldiers, the troop formations, how they fought and how the battle was won. Get the view the generals wished they'd had. Now, on decisive battles. In 451 AD, the Roman Empire was in tatters. The glory days of Augustus, a distant memory. Back then, the Roman Empire had stretched from the Mediterranean Sea and far beyond into Europe, Asia, and Africa. By 451 AD, Rome was no longer the center of government, and the empire was split in two. The Eastern Empire, based in Constantinople, was wealthy and well-maintained, but the Western Empire was overrun by barbarian tribes. The Roman Empire was neither Roman nor it was an empire. It, was, it had been dissected between East and West. It was not in control of its borders. They would have been progressively hard pressed to see a oneness in the empire that was about them. It was made up of armies, it was made up of governors, it was made up of garrisons and towns. Uh, it had become a fragmented world. From Ravenna in northern Italy, Valentinian III ruled over the remnants of the Western Empire. He claimed to rule Spain, Gaul, and Italy. In reality, these countries were controlled by local leaders and barbarian settlers. Gaul, or modern-day France, was ruled by the Visigoths. Italy by the Vandals. What's more, Valentinian's general and chief advisor, Flavius Atius, was half barbarian. He was obviously a, a very capable commander with considerable experience. He was clearly a very considerable politician. He had occupied the top spot for quite some years. He had an Italian mother, but was raised among the Visigoths, and had even spent a year with the Huns. He knew Hunnic ways, he grew up in a silk tent, he learned to ride a horse probably with the Huns. He's often called the last of the real Romans, the last of the noble Romans, or the noble Roman. And as much as for 30 years he seems to have been very active on the northwest frontier of Rome in a series of holding actions, trying to keep out Franks, trying to keep out Goths from getting into the unprotected and bountiful areas of central Italy and Spain. The Western Empire was now little more than an enticing target for the barbarian tribes. And in 451 AD, there was one barbarian leader who stood out from all of the others, Attila the Hun. Attila, or Attila, is represented as the super barbarian. He was slightly graying, he was bent over, he was very muscular, probably entering middle age, squat, dark, swarthy person. The Huns were horsemen from the steppes of Asia. Many of the Germanic tribes were Christians of some shape or form. The Huns were not. Uh, and of course, Attila was described as being, quote, the scourge of God. Everyone feared the Huns, and with good reason. In a lightning raid through the Eastern Empire, they left behind a trail of destruction. St. Jerome wrote, they filled the whole earth with slaughter and panic, and they took pity neither upon religion nor rank, nor race nor age, nor wailing childhood. By 450 AD, Attila was looking for his next target. The rich Eastern Empire was paying him an annual tribute of 2,100 pounds in gold to stay away. But the Huns couldn't live by plunder alone. They were nomads who needed to be on the move. Their very existence was predicated on constant motion. They had to find always new sources of plunder, always new sources of fodder. And to stay in one place would mean that they would literally eat themselves out of their locale within a matter of weeks. 
So Attila turned his attention to the west, which was now ruled by rival barbarian tribes. Most of Gaul was ruled by the Visigoth leader Theodoric. Geyseric, ruler of the Vandals, controlled most of Italy. The two men hated each other. Things came to a head when Geyseric's son, who was married to Theodoric's daughter, cut her nose and ears off during an argument. Geyseric saw a chance to destroy his rival. He encouraged Attila the Hun to invade Gaul and overthrow Theodoric. It was the opportunity Attila had been waiting for. The opportunity to divide and conquer. Attila thought that it offered um, a pretty good cost-benefit ratio. You could plunder it pretty easily and the chances that you'd be killed or captured or punished were not very great. The Roman general Attius saw the writing on the wall. He knew the Huns well from having spent time living among them. He'd even been on friendly terms with Attila. So he knew that if Attila was allowed to conquer Gaul, he wouldn't stop until he'd swept south into Italy and completely destroyed the Western Empire. Attius knew that he would have to join forces with Theodoric's army to save the West. He couldn't defeat the Huns on his own. Though Theodoric was no friend of the Romans, he reluctantly agreed to fight alongside of them. To Attila, the opportunity to invade Gaul was irresistible. He was isolated and rich. In 451, he crossed the Rhine with a huge army. Terrified chroniclers claimed he had more than half a million men under his command. The core of the Hunnic army was surely the Huns themselves. There's no way to tell how many people that means. Uh, my guess is surely not more than 10,000 effective Hunnic warriors. But more impressive than numbers was his ability to lay siege to a city, something few barbarian armies had ever been able to achieve. The Huns rampaged through Europe, burning city after city. Cologne, Mainz, Metz, Strasbourg, Reims, until in June 451, they reached Orléans. Matthias had to stop the Huns there before they poured into Italy. He was all that now stood between Attila the Hun and the destruction of the West. The Battle of Shalom. It is 451 AD. Attila had destroyed everything in his path as he galloped through Gaul with his horde of horse archers and auxiliaries. The Roman commander, Attias, rode hard to the city of Orléans with his newly found ally, Theodoric, king of the Visigoths. We simply do not know the size of their combined armies, but historians believe they were easily outnumbered by the Huns. They arrived just in time. Sangeban, the ruler of Orléans, was about to surrender to the Huns. A fierce battle began in the suburbs of the city. Attila, never afraid to retreat and regroup if things looked bleak, pulled his men out of the street fight and made for the open country. If there was to be a battle, Attila wanted it out in the open spaces where the Hun cavalry could have free reign. He pitched camp near the town of Shalom. The Huns drew up their wagon lager and prepared to crush Attias and his ragtag army. Attila made no attempt to fight until mid-afternoon. Instead, he stayed inside his wagon circle. Was he looking to provisions for his troops? Or was he playing mind games by making the Romans wait for hours in battle formation? When he finally did march, most of the daylight had gone. But the Romans had no difficulty in seeing the huge army which formed up behind him. Attila's plan of attack was pretty simple, and that was to put the Huns themselves in the middle of the battle line and head as quickly and as directly across the field of battle and then tear apart the center of the enemy army. Attila placed himself in the center of the line of battle with his own Huns. On his flanks, he placed his barbarian allies, the Ostrogoths, Arderic, and Gepids. These would have been more standard cavalry, 
armed with spears and swords, and relying on mobility and momentum to inflict damage. On the other side of the battlefield, Atias placed his Romans on the left flank. He ordered Theodoric and his Visigoths to line up on the right flank. And in the middle, he put the cowardly Sangevin. It came as no surprise when Attila prepared to strike at the weakest point of the Roman line. Romans had placed the weakest part of their force in the center. A person who was a commander of a group of barbarians who had just, in the past few weeks, been negotiating with Attila to surrender. The Romans placed that force in the middle so that they couldn't get, get away and can't, couldn't run away. That's precisely where it turned out Attila's force struck. Atlas strength hit Roman weakness. Atias was no fool. His plan was to draw Attila into the center. This would enable the left flank and the Visigoths on the right to cut off the Huns' line of retreat back to their wagon camp. It was a ruthless plan. Atias was prepared to gamble the lives of Sangeban and his men to help save the Roman Empire in the west. Attila ordered a mass cavalry charge straight at the Roman line. The Battle of Shalom was engaged. The Huns smashed into Sanjaban's troops, smack in the center of the line. Sanjaban fell back, and the Huns pushed forward in pursuit. But Atias found the going tough, until his tribal allies fought hard. And although the Romans hemmed them in, they did not have the sufficient numbers to completely outflank and envelop them. His idea was that if his Visigothic allies on the right and Romans and Franks on the left could sandwich in Attila, then he could enfold them on the flanks and do some type of canine encirclement. The Visigoths had been held up by fierce resistance on the right flank. The battle was incredible in its ferocity. The casualties must have been staggering, although the, the numbers given in the, in the sources are, are just for literary effect. But surely thousands of men were perishing that day. The battle swung to and fro. Because it had begun so late in the day, the light began to fade quickly. If the Huns were able to fall back to their wagons, it would be very difficult for the Romans to attack a fortified position in the dark. It was late in the afternoon, and it was getting dark. They fought until they couldn't see each other, and then the battle continued into the darkness. It was one of these battles without end. The Visigoths chose to attack the flank of the Hun. So it was the Visigoths who saved the day. Their added weight seemed enough to turn the tide of war in Atias's favor. For now, Attila was being pressed on both flanks, and his Hun warriors were being closed down and denied the space they needed to fight effectively. Then, just as the tide of battle was swinging Rome's way, tragedy struck. In the thick of the fighting, Theodoric 
king of the Visigoths was thrown from his horse. Before he could get to his feet, he was trampled under the hooves of his own cavalry. Matthias was in a perilous position. He had lost his key ally. But the Visigoths continued to fight without their king. Could he fight on in the dark? The Battle of Shallow. It is 451 AD, and the Roman general Atias is fighting to save Western civilization from the barbarian menace of Attila the Hun. But his key ally, Theodoric the Visigoth, has just been killed. Theodoric's son, Thorismund, now took command of the Visigoths. Luckily for Atias, the loss of their king drove them on to avenge his death. Their horsemen plowed into the ranks of the Hun army, and suddenly it was Attila who was feeling the pressure. The Huns suffered huge casualties. With the Visigoths in full cry, the Romans found themselves with the upper hand. The only trouble was, there was no time to exploit this advantage. The sun had set, there was no more light, and chaos reigned on the battlefield of Shallow. In the darkness, forces became detached. Aetius himself, much as uh, Stonewall Jackson, got detached from his forces and was all but lost, and then found his troops. In the darkness, Thorismund mistook the Huns for his own troops and came close to being killed or captured. The Visigoths were lucky not to lose two kings in one day. Night battles are ferocious. And th the thing is, you need to dis disengage because you, you can't control the situation. Attila was able to escape to his wagon camp. The darkness had saved his army from annihilation. He had two choices inspire his troops for another day's fierce combat, or retreat and live to fight another day. So in the, the worst hour of the Hun East Army's existence, when they were surrounded, they'd been defeated, what did uh, Attila do? He deliberately screamed, yelled, he showed his masculinity, his fearlessness, and then he actually created a funeral pyre and threatened to immolate himself. Uh, so little did he value his own life and so much that he value, uh, value the reputation that he would die undefeated. Neither of these two great commanders, they didn't know what it, the casualties were that they had inflicted. They knew, however, that their own troops were terribly bloodied. These two armies had exhausted themselves. Atias probably got little sleep. He was left with a real dilemma. On the one hand, he had the opportunity to crush Attila once and for all. On the other, he had to consider the future security of the empire. The Visigoths had only supported him because of Attila's invasion. The Vandals were also unreliable. These tribes only stayed in line because of a Hun menace. Remove that and warfare could break out all over the West. There was the perception that maybe the destruction of the Hunnish army might uh, embolden other tribes that are now our allies, but after the battle will be our enemies. And back at Ravenna, the governing center of the empire, the Emperor Valentinian was worried that Atias was now the most powerful man in the West. To the people, he was the heir to the Roman generals of old. Already they were calling him the last of the Romans. The next morning, it's essentially a stalemate. The Huns are in possession of their log air, and the Romans are in possession of the battlefield, which meant that the Romans won, but the Huns were still there. The ancient sources tell us that Atias only reached his decision on the following morning when two things happened. First, the body of Theodoric was recovered and his son Thorismon was proclaimed to be the new king of the Visigoths. Second, it was obvious that Attila was trying to pull out rather than prepare for another battle. Attila withdrew the next day because he realized that his army was in no condition once dawn uh, rose and they saw that horrific carnage on the battlefield and tens of thousands of people had been killed, he realized he was in no position to press home the attack. Atias knew his own personal standing was high. He had just beaten Attila the Hun, the scourge of Europe. But could he trust the Visigoths now that they had a new king? And what about Geyseric the Vandal? The Hun invasion had been his idea. Atias had done enough. Attila was in retreat. The West was safe. He decided to take his close-fought victory an attempt to strengthen the Roman position. I think that what the battle did was it brought people together 
It brought the military and political forces of the Empire in the West together one last time. The mauling that Atias gave Attila at Shalon was to prove the deciding factor. True to form, the Huns launched another lightning campaign against the Romans the following year. They swept down into Italy, utterly destroying the land as they went. But a Roman counter-strike against Attila's own land across the Danube was enough to make Attila agree to a peace. He just didn't have the men to protect his borders any longer. Attias had killed too many of them at Shalom. The following year, Attila the Hun died as he had lived, bloodily. He married a young bride, and drank so much that when he had a nosebleed, he drowned in his own blood. Without their fearsome leader, the empire of the Huns splintered and fell apart. And as for Atias, historians badly as well. A few years after Shalon, he tried to marry Eudoxia, a daughter of Valentinian. In a jealous rage, Valentinian stabbed him to death. The last of the Romans was killed by his own emperor.